Coming up next on Marketing Mavericks, we talk to Chris Brandt, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Taco Bell. He's going to share a little bit about their secret sauce and why the breakfast campaign is so huge for them. We've also got Tamson Webster and Esteban Contreras. We're going to talk about Oculus Rift and why that's important for marketers. Stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Marketing Mavericks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks, the intersection of marketing and technology. We've got a great show that we're going to talk all about digital marketing and the things that we love, the things that we don't like, some of our favorite apps, our software, and the controversy that might be hitting in social media. We're also going to talk about some campaigns that we like. We've got a a really important guest with us today, the Chief Marketing Officer at Taco Bell, Chris Brandt, is going to be joining us. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Good morning, everybody. So, um, you know, pretty exciting times for Taco Bell. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's the wrong camera. One second. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Anthony, I don't know how many times I have to tell you, he's got to have his Taco Bell fix in the morning. That was, what was that? Was that the... Uh... That's the waffle <laughs> yeah, taco there. The waffle taco. Anthony, you interrupt, inter you interrupt for that whenever you need to. <laughs> yeah. the, the waffle taco. But I, I really don't know, you know... <laughs> what 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 we're doing here? No, seriously. So you guys have some really exciting campaigns. We've been talking, I think, over the last week about the Ronald McDonald uh, campaign. You've um, you've got this new uh, campaign that's starting today, which um, I have some questions about. But you guys have always been great marketers at Taco Bell. You've done such a great job using social media and a lot of different ways. But let's sort of step back for a minute because you've been at Taco Bell um, for what? about a year and a half now is that right actually um a little over three years three years okay before that you were with um a couple of different brands you've actually worked for adwala which is a coca-cola brand you've um, launched a variety of projects uh including protein smoothies and you've worked for general mills which has got famous brands like betty crocker so you've got a, a long line of working with some pretty established brands and launching products so it shouldn't be anything new, but why? I mean, you went from kind of a, a more healthy point of view with Adwala to, and I know Taco Bell's doing that, um, getting healthier. Was that a part of the reason why you decided to join Taco Bell or was that something that happened after you joined the team? Uh, no, I, I, I grew up in Southern California. And so um, I always loved Taco Bell. Taco Bell was always had a special place in my heart. And I really like the things that Taco Bell did. One, the, the one hallmark of the things that I've, the, the brands that I've worked on, whether it be Nature Valley or You'll Play or ultimately Odwalla and then Taco Bell is they really put a premium on innovation and new products. And so when I was looking for another opportunity or really wasn't even looking that hard, um, when Taco Bell came up um, to do a, a to work on a brand like Taco Bell, to really shape a big brand like Taco Bell, to do a lot of innovative things, um, it was a pretty easy decision for me to make to to come to Taco Bell. So Taco Bell has gotten healthy. You know, I'm, I'm actually a pretty loyal Taco Bell. I, I'm going to date myself a little bit here. But I remember when I was in college, I would eat the soft tacos and, you know, hold the cheese. And, you know, I knew how many calories it had. Um, and today you've got um, a whole line of, of uh, product that's health focused, but not so much with the breakfast. You've kind of gone a little more towards, I think, the trend movement. Why not have a healthy breakfast launch? Why, why the waffle taco? So just one thing. So you can make anything at Taco Bell, you know, lower calorie, lower fat by what, doing what we call fresco, which really takes off a lot of the sauces and the cheese and replaces it with pico. And so, um, and the one thing people should also know is you can customize anything at Taco Bell. If you don't see it on the menu or there's things on there you don't like, um, feel free to take it off because we make everything to order right there. So it really is not a problem. I think from a breakfast standpoint, um, we wanted to have a tight menu that we could really execute well in the stores. But, you know, a third of the breakfast items that we have 
are uh, under 300 calories. Over half the menu is under 400 calories. And you can order any of our breakfast burritos, fresco style again, where it removes the sauce and the cheese and uh, replaces it with pico. Um, still gives you a really flavorful, still gives you flavorful options but um, at 25% less fat. So there are ways certainly to watch what you eat and eat healthy at Taco Bell. But um, we know from a breakfast standpoint, people really want a lot of craveable items. Almost everyone at breakfast orders a breakfast sandwich. And so we felt like we had a number of options, including the AM Crunch Wrap, which we believe is the best breakfast sandwich out there um, in the marketplace uh, to, to satisfy people's needs in the morning. So we're, we're right now playing the, the Ronald McDonald campaign that's hit social media. Ronald McDonald Jr. And this is and McDonald III. people love it, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's funny, it's, it's catchy, people are remembering it. And ultimately, people are interested now in, you know, what you're doing with the breakfast menu. How do you track the success? I mean, you know, in the past, we would, you know, launch TV commercials or drop mail or do advertising, but you use... Uh, social media quite a bit to engage with your customers and your fans. You've got a great Twitter page, which uh, is a lot of fun. But how do you actually track the success of a campaign like Ronald McDonald? So, um, well, one is sales, right? Are we driving people into the stores? Are we seeing um, lists on that? But as you mentioned, Tanya, um, the social media tracking is a big part of what we do. We want to make sure that people like it, people are engaging with it. Um, our whole strategy in social media is to really move people from just being fans of Taco Bell, ultimately being friends of Taco Bell, and then hopefully we can be the cool friend. And so um, – we really try, one of the mantras we have of Live Moss is to be effortlessly cool. We can't look like we're trying too hard. Um, we wanna do everything that has a little bit of a wink, a little bit of rebellion. That's been a hallmark of Taco Bell for years and years. And we wanna keep that going. And so we, we're, what we're really pleased about with um, the Ronald's campaign is that people get the joke, right? People get that there's a sense of humor here. We wanted to make sure we weren't coming across as um, anything other than humorous and had a wink. And so that's when we got the response that's been really overwhelmingly positive from consumers. I mean, for me personally, um, there's been a lot of people who have sent me notes and said, hey, what a great campaign. I think the best story is um, we were in a store and this gentleman came in and he said, you know, I'm a college professor. And he said, I have to confess, I haven't been to Taco Bell in years, but when I saw the Ronald's campaign, I just thought it was so clever and so humorous that it had to come in. And so those are the kinds of uh, things that are music to a marketer's ears. I mean, that's exactly what you're trying to do is get people interested enough, get people engaged, give people an experience in the advertising that gets them to, uh, to come in the store for sure. So, okay, we do love the Ronald McDonald campaign. It's clever, it's witty. Um, you're kind of poking fun at your competition, but you have another campaign that launched today, um, which I have to say was um, kind of hit a little close to home for me. Egg McMuffin since 1984. But when I saw Taco Bell made a waffle taco, I figured I would get with the times. So I got a haircut and I got some tighter pants. Lost my flip phone, got a smartphone, even took down my lover boy poster. Now I'm eating waffle tacos and AM crunch wraps. And I just made like $700 on Craigslist. Move on from your old McDonald's <laughs> breakfast with Taco Bell's exciting new. I gotta breakfast. say, um, Galaga. I love Galaga. Why did he have to get I rid of it? I think that, that might have been the last <laughs> video game I was actually good at. I'm really good. It's on. You know what? I think we have a Galaga <laughs> here at Twit. I, you know, I, I challenge you to come here to the Brick House and I will play you. It's a very clever commercial. You're clearly targeting um, people who kind of have that nostalgia um, feeling about Taco Bell. A lot of your product products we have nostalgic feelings about. But who are your, who is your target customer? Is it the 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 younger you know millennials or are you targeting people who grew up in the 80s yeah i think from a the tonality certainly of our ad campaign is is um millennials but the intro one of the interesting things about taco bell is that we have about the same amount of volume that comes from people above 35 as below 35 and but what we try to do is we want to be a, a cool and relevant brand we actually want to be a lifestyle brand not just a food brand and so we really need to appeal to millennials or honestly um as we will always appeal to folks in their 20s because the people in their 20s are the people who define what culture is about. They define, you know, in terms of music and in food um, and in fashion and everything, they're defining what is cool. And so we need to talk to those people. The great news about talking to those people and being a lifestyle brand like we do is that we're not alienating other people. I mean, I think pe plenty of people who grew up in the 80s still identify with Taco Bell. They still identify with the things that um, 
uh, today are, are, are cool from a lifestyle standpoint. And so if we can talk in that tone of voice, um, we believe, yes, we're appealing to millennials, but we're also appealing to a lot of people because everybody wants to think about themselves like when they were in their 20s, whether you're 15, you kind of want to be 22. And certainly if you're uh, around 40, you finally remember those days in your 20s as well. So we feel like we we definitely want to hit millennials. They are our core target. That's who we want to appeal to. But uh, we think we can encompass um, a lot of different generations by doing so. And you've set some pretty aggressive goals. You you shared at the beginning of the year that you wanted to double revenue, and that's a lot. I mean, double doubling your revenue is a pretty hefty, uh, sizable amount to announce. How do you plan to do that? And and are, how big is social media and digital marketing going to play into them? Yeah, I think so. It is a bold goal. Um, we we had a goal of going from seven to fourteen billion dollars. Um, about a year and a half ago. The good news is we've we've added a billion. And uh, I think we have a plan grow both to grow our same store sales growth for sure, but also to expand in terms of the number of stores that we add. And um, you know, what we do from a marketing standpoint is we have to just listen to the consumer and appeal to the consumer uh, all the time. And clearly the consumer, uh, especially this millennial consumer, is focused in social media. Again, uh, they really define themselves by their social media credibility. And so it has been a big part of our plan. Um, TV uh, will continue to be a big part of our plan, but certainly embracing social and digital. And I think that, you know, as you alluded to, Tanya, we've done a pretty good job of that so far, but uh, we have to keep being at the forefront of that. We are a brand of first. We want to be the first in some of these new places, um, places like Snapchat, Instagram, Vine. Um, we've done some great things there, and we will continue to monitor where the big trends are, where people are migrating towards and make sure that we are there with a relevant message. I mean, I think media is really changing these days. Uh, there's no bigger revolution going on than what's happening in the media world um, with the rise of digital. And so we just, we, our mantra is we need to have the right message at the right time on the right platform uh, for people. And so you look at us and in, in the things that we've done in social media, but also, you know, we announced a mobile initiative that we're doing and we're really excited to launch that later this year. So one of the questions that I had, and it's actually coming up in our chat room, is how do you approach, because all the platforms are different. You've got Facebook, which has one approach, or Twitter, and your audiences are different. But Snapchat, how do you actually use Snapchat to promote Taco Bell? So one of the things that we want to make sure is how, what is the me what is the message on the particular platform that is really relevant? And uh, we were really excited with Snapchat because obviously Snapchat, for, for those of you who don't know, is you um, and I'm sure everybody who's listening to this probably knows, but you can put a message out there and then it disappears. Well, um, what we did is we launched a limited time offer product of a product called Beefy Crunch Burrito. And uh, we were one of the first brands to actually advertise on Snapchat. So what better way to launch a limited time offer product, especially one that we've had before that had a good following is to put it on Snapchat and uh, um, put it out there, you know, just for a temporary period of time. So it was really fun to do. And I think that we continue to innovate on Snapchat and we're gonna do some exciting things on Snapchat here coming up in the next few weeks. Um, around the MTV Movie Awards. So um, we view it as a great platform. Again, I think it's putting the right message on the right platform. If you look at what we did on Instagram, for example, um, our advertising there is very different than you might see in another venue because Instagram is really was founded by professional photographers. We needed to make sure we had great advertising creative that would live and be endemic to that platform as opposed to just throwing something else out there from somewhere else that might not fit in that environment as well. Being such a nostalgic brand and, you know, myself, I've mentioned, you know, I'm a big fan of Taco Bell. I've, I actually, my, my number one favorite item is the Mexi Melt. Um, awesome. <laughs> so I'm a Mexi Melt girl. But, you know, how do you tap into that younger audience? And so you've, you've got me and you've got my age group. But how do you actually think like the younger demographic? I think um, it's really about engagement. Uh, you know, the younger demographic had, they've all, they've grown up with technology. They are always on, they're always connected. They have an innate fear of missing out. And again, I think they're defined by their social networks. And so where we can engage them and they, they don't just, you know, back when um, I first started in marketing, we called all of our, our uh, marketing vehicles, you know, methods of mass persuasion. And uh, we can no longer just persuade because the millennial today, they don't just they don't want to be talked at, they want to be talked to. They want to be engaged. And so we need to engage them with an experience. And so I think new products are great and innovative products are great and everybody likes those, but we have to talk to people and tell stories 
um, to people that they're, they're going to engage and connect with in a relevant way. And a big part of that is using social media to do that. And so we want to be where consumers are and talk to them in a relevant voice. And I think that the, you know, the social media team we have has done a great job of capturing what the tonality of Live Moss is, this kind of a little bit of a wink and um, a little bit of rebellion out there. And that resonates with uh, the millennials today in a great way. And so we're not just providing a, uh, a product, but we're giving people an experience. And that's all part of um, what they'll connect and relate to in a great way. So we feel like we can exclude uh, people like you and me, Tanya, who grew up with Taco Bell, but the new generation coming out um, by talking to them in the right voice and in the right way, we're going to be really relevant for the, for them. And then so when they get to be our age, um, they'll connect with Taco Bell um, going forward as well. You've, um, you're a part of the Yum brand. So you've got Kentucky Fried Chicken, Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell, which all have, you know, um, seem to be combining in locations. And you can get sometimes not just Taco Bell, but KFC. How does that marketing work? I mean, how do you... How do you translate the marketing when you have a combined um, restaurant? Yeah, so uh, the, basically we, it, you know, it's it's KFC's job to drive people into KFC. It's Pizza Hut's job to drive people into Pizza Hut. And it's my job certainly to drive people into Taco Bell. So we handle it very separately. Um, we are distinct brands that just happen to be housed in, a, um, in the same building. But uh, we handle everything very separately. We obviously share a lot of learning and, and, um, uh, tricks of the trade, if you will, or things that have uh, been successful with our sister brands. But by and large, um, we all act, we all operate autonomously and uh, are, are trying to build our own brands at the same time. So one of the, the things that we were asked to, um, to talk to you about, which is this idea of a secret menu at Taco Bell. Um, is this folklore or is there truly a secret menu? There truly are um, secret menu uh, items that are on there. Again, that's part of the magic of Taco Bell and customization. So if you see something that you used to have, um, you can order it. And uh, things like, um, so one of the most popular products we have is the cheesy gordita crunch. You can order that cheesy, it's basically a taco inside of another soft taco, uh, which is in gordita bread. And uh, it's an amazing product, but you can try ordering that um, with uh, Doritos Locos Taco instead of a regular taco on the inside for a nice surprise. So there's a number of, of secret menu items that, that you can order. And uh, that is alive and well, I think, part of the culture of, of what Taco Bell is about. So it sounds quirky, but is that a part of the marketing strategy? Or, I mean, do you, how do you factor in these um, types of, of quirky, you know, the secret menu item, the folklore around, you know, other types of things related to Taco Bell? Yeah, one of the things you want to give people um, – people want to feel like they're in the know and they get something a little bit special. And so um, we want to make sure that we're giving, because that helps build their social cred credibility. So when I can give somebody um, something a little special or something that um, they don't feel like everybody knows about, then uh, that helps build their credibility. They can tell other people that gets the conversation going about Taco Bell and keep, and, and um, it's just, but it's also a, really a characteristic of our brand. We're a brand known for innovation. We're a brand known for, for fun things. What we're trying to do with Live Moss is just give people just something a little bit different, something a little bit better, something a little bit more fun in their day. And secret menu items certainly play uh, into that um, into that mantra. How much of your marketing spend is allocated towards digital? Uh, I'd rather not just share exact percentages because it kind of fluctuates all the time. <laughs> but I will tell you that uh, we spend a significant amount of money in digital. We have a significant effort in digital. Um, and uh, I think that probably will continue to grow over time as uh, people migrate to different platforms. I mean, one of the interesting things we know right now is that from a millennial standpoint, literally something like 80, 85 percent of them are tweeting um, or using Twitter or other social media platforms when they're watching TV. So it's not just being, you know, back in the old days, you could put something on TV and you could make sure it reached everybody, but uh, you can't do that anymore. We have to have um, a much more robust marketing mix. We have to figure out where people are and we have to have, I think, multiple messages going at the same time. And so that's part of the art of what we do versus um, the science part. And uh, it makes it uh, an interesting job, certainly all the time. So you're talking about the second screen, which is a really important part of any marketing strategy. You're such a large uh, company, it's a large brand. And I think, you know, going, you know, in a small business or a small brand, you have 
certainly a much, I think, more manageable concept of how to engage with customers. You, your customer base is huge. How do you use social media to feel fully engaged with customers with second yeah. screens? Yeah, you're, you're right, I think. And, you know, it's interesting because people talk about the second screen. I think TV might all uh, might already be the second screen. The first screen, you look at your cell phone, actually, much more often than you than you look at a TV. And so, um, and people are consuming media all over the place. And you see the different, you know, you look at somebody like Yahoo talking about getting into um, TV shows. And you look at the rise of Netflix and binge TV viewing and all those things. And how do you sort all those um, pieces out? Um, but it's our job to just be where the consumers are. And so uh, that's a big part of how we think about uh, social media and make sure it's relevant to people because certainly, you know, we're a big brand. As you mentioned, Tony, there are 35, 37 million people a week that actually go into Taco Bell and half the country visits Taco Bell inside of a month. But um, there are, um, and so there's vehicles we can do to engage those folks and certainly TV is a big one, but um, the social media piece to engage our true fans and to engage people who are very passionate about Taco Bell. And that's one of the great things about Taco Bell. And you touched on it a little bit earlier, but whenever I ask somebody about Taco Bell, they always have a story. They always have a smile on their face when they're telling that story. We're lucky to have such a passionate brand like that. And so when we can talk to our consumers and engage them um, in a meaningful way, in a really relevant way, uh, that's that's really a lot of satisfaction for us. But it ultimately, it helps build not only the sales today, so sales overnight, but it helps to build our brand over time, um, which is what we're all trying to do from a, a brand marketing standpoint. You have a reputation for using social media to acquire talent for your um, for your different uh, job openings that you have across the United States. How, how do you do that? How do you use social media to hire people? Well, we, you know, the people we want certainly on the social media team, um, they, they need to be adept at social media. And the great thing is um, some of the people we have actually reached out to us. We've put out there, you know, asking people to submit. Um, if, if we're going to communicate in Twitter, if we're going to communicate, you know, in just a, a few sentences and um, just a, a small number of characters, we need people to be able to express themselves that way. So what better way to interview somebody um, than uh, in a format where they're going to be conversing with the consumer all the time. And what's amazing is the amount of creativity that's out there and uh, the engagement that you can have. And so um, we've done some experimenting in that space. We've hired people the conventional way too, but I think it's, you know, we, we're hiring people for their creativity and their social media credibility to work on that, on that team. And uh, it's proven to be a great, what, what better way to do it than to use the vehicles that they're going to interact on um, all the time. How much does, as, as a leader, of, as a head of marketing for um, such a large uh, company and a large brand, how does your personal point of view play into the marketing strategy? Do you, does that come into play at all? I mean, be, you know, being a family man or being a father or your, your hobbies, I mean, how does that actually play into your strategy? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Again, this is uh, marketing is um, an art versus a science. And so there's always things that you feel in your gut. And I've, I've been lucky to work on some great brands for some great people. And so I think that shapes me. And then, you know, my individual experience is the things that my kids um, really love. Um, sometimes that meets the sniff test as well. You always got to listen to the consumer, but you know, there's a balance to, especially in new items that sometimes consumers can't imagine them as much. Um, I use my kids, you know, I think my, my uh, my uh, boys both love our uh, beefy nacho loaded griller. And I think that um, I might be disowned if I ever decided to discontinue that product. Now, the good news is it's a very popular product all, um, all around. So I don't have that dilemma. But, uh, um, you know, there's certainly things that they're passionate about um, that we want to keep going. And, and everybody has that kind of experience. You know, I eat Taco Bell three or four times a week. And uh, we have a, a variety of menu items. And, you know, when you go out in the field and with our ops folks and you see what's happening actually in the stores and how things are working and talk to consumers, it's a great data point for you to have, um, you know, an individual data point in the sea of all of the other consumer data points that we have that you that you factor in that I think colors your decisions and, and helps you hopefully make the right decisions for everybody. You've got a pretty um, successful, large agency of record that you choose that also promotes some other really popular brands. Um, and I guess my question would be, how do you decide to go with, I mean, an all purpose agency? Do you try to say, okay, I'm gonna have this agency handle my digital, this agency handle my creative. How do you decide who's going to be um, the creative concept behind Taco Bell? 
Yeah, we have a, a multiple agency model. So we use Digitas for a lot of our digital initiatives. We use Deutsch and uh, FCB for um, a lot of our TV, but they cross over. I mean, the one thing today is integrated marketing is more important than other. Um, you know, in the past with TV dominated, maybe you could get by being a different brand on some of the other channels, but you just can't do that anymore. Everything, people see everything all at the same time. And so we have, I think the part of the challenge for, you know, myself and my team is to make sure that all those agencies are working towards the same goal and that we're really clear about our briefs and um, what's gonna lead. So um, one of the things we love having our different agencies, we love having different points of view. Um, and I think that that is a big help. It's a more, little bit more cumbersome to manage than an all-in-one agency, but we also think we get great creative and we get a lot of different ideas. And what we're, what's at a premium here are creative ideas that we can really blow up into, uh, um, into big ideas. And so um, the, the more points of view that we have and the more different approaches we have, we feel like the better off we'll be. It's such a, a changing landscape, the digital marketing space and how we use social media and how we play that into the rest of our marketing. How do you stay on top of that? I mean, what's your biggest challenge when it comes to this ever moving um, arena? It is no doubt a, a big challenge and things change quickly um, and on a dime. And so the, I am lucky that I have such a really strong team that keeps up on, on top of those things. We have millennials that um, are obsessed with social media, are great at it, and they're telling us what the next ones are. They're telling us, hey, Snapchat is getting big. We should do something on that platform. They're looking at Vine, they're looking at Instagram, they're looking at Tumblr, they're looking at all of these things and figuring out what is next and how do we use it best? And again, how do we have um, a tone of voice that's the brand tone of voice in those places, but creative that is relevant to those platforms as well. So I really rely on, and the other part is, we really demand people who are curious here and are constantly looking for the next new thing. And so, you know, we have, you know, 70, 75 people in our marketing department that are all focused against that. And there's a lot of, uh, we call it know-how. There's a lot of information sharing and know-how sharing that happens within Taco Bell. Um, not just with the social media group, but, you know, with our ops partners, with our, um, our innovation partners, our food innovation partners as well. So all of those things together really help us uh, stay on top of what's going on uh, out there in the marketplace, be it technology or competitive actions or what have you. Okay, so if somebody's interested in working for Taco Bell at the, the marketing level, how, how would they go about, like, what is your advice to the next uh, Taco Bell employee? What should they do to be noticed um, at the corporate level? I think um, you want to demonstrate uh, a lot of creativity, a lot of curiosity, and a lot of leadership. Um, we really we really look for people who are willing to do things and think about things a little bit differently, bring a lot of creativity to the table, and, um, you know, and have some fun. I mean, one of the things that we have here at Taco Bell, I think really sets us apart, makes us special, is the culture we have. It is, uh, you know, a lot of companies talk about kind of a work hard, play hard culture. I think we do have that at Taco Bell. There's a lot of camaraderie here. Um, it is a pretty special place that I think you can feel when you enter the building for the first time. And uh, those are the things that I think we really look for in people. And um, those are the people we, we try to find that are really gonna fit our culture and, and not just fit our culture, but add to our culture ultimately um, to make this uh, uh, continue to be a, a great place to work, but um, an innovative place as well. Well, you know, and I'm I ever impressed by what you, I love your snarky, I love the snarky Twitter uh, page that you have. And I think you do a great job. You know, I ask this question to CMOs all the time. What, what other CMO would you like to meet or who do you think is really doing a good job in the digital space? Hmm. Um, you know, we, we, we look at, um, what people like, uh, MTV and kind of things are doing from, uh, to, to relate to millennials. So even outside of, uh, the QSR space, I think we look to see, you know, what those brands are doing. I think, um, it, it depends on the platform too. I think some brands do a great job on different platforms. You know, the, the Levi's brand actually does a pretty good job, I think on Instagram in terms of the, the imagery and, th and things that they do. And uh, so we're kind of looking at a bunch of different people. And, um, you know, we look at Apple and see what they do. Really like the stuff that Nike does. I mean, you talk about a company that's made themselves into not just a product brand, but a lifestyle brand. Um, you know, we've actually, they were kind enough to invite us up there to Oregon and, and uh, you know, build some learning, build some know-how with them about how they approach innovation, how they approach their brand. So I think that those are some of the brands to me that stand out there. There's some smaller brands that um, we kind of look at as well, but we want to find our own voice. I think that's the, the really important thing. What we did was with Liv Moss, I think as we move from think outside the bun 
Um, we did it because the consumer had changed. They didn't want food as fuel anymore. They wanted food as an experience. So we thought with Live Moss, we needed to really define ourselves. We have a North Star now for the company. And I think that guides us as much as um, anything else in terms of what we want Taco Bell to be going forward. You, you've got a lot of different elements that relate to technology that are a part of your campaign. I mentioned Twitter just because you have a really fun Twitter page. And, and it's something so simple but can make a big impact on your brand. What mm -hmm. happens? Do you have something in place if for some reason things go off? I mean, how important is a PR strategy to Taco Bell? I think our PR team has done an absolutely magnificent job on breakfast. I think the latest count was we were over 5 billion um, impressions in media. And so they have just done an extraordinary job being a big tool for us in a big launch like breakfast. And they, you know, they did it for us on Doritos Locos Tacos as well. So I think PR is huge, but to your point, Tony, I think we're trying to react to whatever um, the consumer says and we're, we're, we're and, and that's what I think the beauty of social media does for some people. It can be a little intimidating that you have to, you're giving up some control of your brand, but um, if you're doing the right things, people will tell you and people will defend you against people. There's always going to be some haters out there, right? Haters are going to hate, but um, your fans are going to are going to are going to help you. And and uh, they're going to say some things that you might not even want to say, um, but they can say it. And so I think that that's a, a, a big, important part um, of what we're doing. But again, everything is um, the integrated marketing approach. And so the things we do in digital and social, I mean, one of the biggest things we did at breakfast to, to create a lot of buzz was the, the the phones. So we sent phones to a thousand influencers and other folks, and we gave them missions to, to wake up and live moss. And, you know, those phones really got a lot of play and people really liked them. And again, if I go back to what we're trying to do is is create an experience for the consumer and to engage them in a in a in a way that they um, that they connect with emotionally. And so um, when we did the burner phones, I mean, what what brand sends people a phone? I mean, that's pretty darn cool. And so as we try to move people from just fans ultimately to considering us as a friend and maybe the cool friend, we have to do things that cool friends do. So um, you know, we sent them phones. We've made a rockumentary. I mean, what what food brand makes a rockumentary that got us into Rolling Stone and Billboard magazine and those kind of things? And, you know, we've thrown a uh, load of growers house party for people. And uh, so all of these things are just part of doing what cool friends do and introducing people to new things. And, you know, another one we had was we had a Friendsgiving, which is the Thanksgiving you have with your friends before the one you might have to endure with your family. So um, we're just trying to take advantage of trends and relate to consumers in a way that is authentic and real. And so far, um, you know, a lot of people who are much cooler than me have done a great job of, of engaging consumers that way and and um, and being relevant uh, to the to today's today's consumer as well. You know, you have done some really interesting things, including using Reddit to answer questions. And I think from a leadership standpoint, I'm pretty impressed with you, your president. I mean, your leadership team is very active, um, you you know, engaging the customer. How important is that, do you think, for any brand? I think it's you, you have to have um, alignment all the way up to the top. And, you know, Brian did a great job uh, on Reddit. And it, but I think it's really showing our personality. So whether it's our CEO, Greg Creed, or whether it's Brian Nickel, or whether it's me, or whether it's our chief operating officer, or chief financial officer, everybody here is jazzed about Taco Bell. This is a, a fun place to work. If you can't have fun at Taco Bell, then something's wrong, right? You, we, this isn't the right place. And I think that we know we have to push the brand and we want to be innovative and we want to try some different things. And that's pretty fun. And so that much, that's what makes it fun to come to work. And I think you see that when, you know, Brian did the, the, the Reddit thing, or when you see um, Greg get quoted in different articles and when people meet these folks, their personality comes through. And we're lucky we have such a um, engaged executive team that wants to push the envelope. And I think that's really a hallmark of the culture we have at Taco Bell and the culture we've built and created. So I, I keep getting this question, but what about the Chihuahua? Are we going to be seeing the Chihuahua again? Uh, well, um, probably not. <laughs> I think uh, I'm not sure that, you know, the, the interesting thing about the Chihuahua is everybody knew the Chihuahua, but it didn't exactly lead to a lot more sales for Taco Bell. Um, I think the Chihuahua was great in a time where food was fuel and we were much more of a, a slapstick comedy brand. And I think that was one of the that was one of the problems is I think the consumer moved on from those kinds of gimmicky things and we didn't. And so what we've really tried to do with Live Moss is um, relate to consumers in today's language and uh, 
um, define ourselves as much more of an explorer than maybe a jester. And um, so you'll see us use humor. You'll see us use some smart humor and some, some you know, uh, just a wink of rebellion, we call it. But uh, things and gimmicky things like the Chihuahua uh, are probably a thing of the past. All right. Well, I have to tell the chat room because they they really want to see the, the Chihuahua come back. But, you know, we're just dog lovers. That's all. Um, we have Ozzy here, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed with everything that you're doing, Chris. And I, I'm excited to see. I'm a little disappointed that they did get rid of the Galaga game in the last commercial that we <laughs> launched today. But other than that, I'm pretty excited. And uh, I think you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. I, I, thanks for having me on and uh, um, appreciate your kind words and uh, stay tuned. We, we've got a lot more to come. I think, you know, we've done a lot of great things in breakfast and we certainly have more to come on breakfast. And uh, so if you haven't tried breakfast already, please check us out. But <laughs> we've got a lot of exciting things coming for the, the rest of the day as well. And so there's a new Doritos Locos taco flavor coming in, uh, um, in early May. So um, look for that as well. I will absolutely look for that. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to have you come back and uh, talk more about your insights in digital marketing. Sure, I'd love to come back anytime. Thanks again, Tanya. Appreciate you. Appreciate you having me on. Absolutely, absolutely. It's so exciting talking to a brand that's doing some really innovative uh, things and uh, engaging customers in a new generation. Um, so that was uh, thanks a lot, and um, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So that was Chris Brandt. You can actually follow him uh, by following at Taco Bell. And um, you can uh, connect with all of their marketing. We're going to link to that later. So next up, we've got Tamson um, joining us. Tamson and Esteban. That's I always want to say Tamson McMahon, but it's actually Tamson Webster. And Esteban Contreras, thanks for joining us, guys. Thank you. Hello. Welcome. Happy to be here. I keep wanting to use your, uh, I guess I'm not used to the Webster yet. I'm sorry about that. How long have you been well, married too? Uh, yeah, a year and a half now. So it's it's been around, Been I've been that way for a while. But yes, a, a proud Webster. I, I married into the dictionary family, which I didn't, <laughs> but that's all right. Now you're, um, you're a senior vice president. Um, you, when I met you, you were at Allen & Garretson and you've moved on. You've uh, started a new role. Tell us a little bit about your new job. So Aradium is a company that really focuses on helping companies architect the message to the marketplace. So uh, I would often say in my work that I did at Allen & Garrett's and in other places that between branding and marketing lies messaging. And that's really what Aradium does. So we focus on how do you take the thing that you stand for, how do you translate it to the marketplace uh, in a way that'll resonate, uh, and and it's that core message that turns into marketing. So we do that. We do executive communication skills uh, for for executives as well. A lot of sales messaging work, uh, branding messaging, nonprofit donor messaging, uh, and I love it. It is it is it is my dream job, and I'm happy to be part of it. Well, I, you know, I have a lot of respect for you and I've had you, uh, I've interviewed you and talked to you quite a bit about this marketing space and we're going to get to that. Esteban Contreras oh. also joining us. He's um, at Thank Social you. Nerdia. He's the director of strategy at Sprinkler. Tell us a little bit about what Sprinkler does. Yeah, Sprinkler is an enterprise social relationship platform. So if you think about the world's biggest and best brands, uh, they usually have thousands of people using uh, all kinds of social networking platforms, right? So they're on Facebook, they're on Twitter, they're everywhere. And so Sprinkler is uh, the best technology for that, at, at least according to Forrester, and we like to think so as well. <laughs> you know, I, I, Sprinkler is a, a great uh, software tool. Okay, um, we, we probably have talked about this a lot um, here at Twit, but we certainly haven't talked about it on Marketing Mavericks because we're new here, but Oculus and Facebook. Why, mm -hmm. you know, I know this is a really hot button for you, Esteban. Um, so how how are marketers actually going to use this? This is a little bit scary, I think, to the people who are really big fans of, uh, you know, this new technology, but there's some opportunity that's actually kind of exciting. What do you see as the opportunity for marketers? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely exciting, I think, for everyone. Um, those with geeky hearts will, will will worry about what is happening to Oculus VR. The rest of the world that didn't even know that there was a new version of the Virtual Boy, um, you know, they're they're thinking they're probably scratching their heads, wondering what's what's going on with all this. But I think it has serious implications into what these tech companies are thinking about. And if Facebook is making a big push towards virtual reality, 
other companies like Sony are doing the same thing, then we can assume that that this is important. And the fact that it's social, you know, this is Facebook's core, but it's also immersive. So it reminds us of things like Second Life uh, or even being in a movie theater, right? These are very immersive experiences where you are there and, and, and there's nothing distracting you, right? There's one screen and you're stuck with that screen. Um, and beyond that, it, it can also add a, a contextual layer, much like a Google Now uh, or a lot of software that's allowing us to, to make sense of, of data and, and, and make con get the context out of uh, what, we're, what we're looking at, what we're experiencing on the screen. And I think that could have really interesting implications for marketing, from movies and entertainment to experiential experiences. At South by Southwest, they did something really interesting with Game of Thrones. But it could be anything. It could be sporting events, education, yoga classes. I mean, in theory, the the implications are, are sort of endless. And I think developers will figure out what works and, and marketers, as always, will figure out what works. And, you know, whether Facebook is going to go after the developers more than the brands is, is to be seen. But my guess is that they'll they'll always try to target those two audiences because that's where the revenue comes from. I think it's it certainly remains to be seen, but I think there are some really exciting opportunities. You mentioned sports. I think there's a lot of application there. I think in shopping, yep, that's important to me. Uh, <laughs> I think I think you know you really have to be open. It's it's a little scary. I think people are expecting you know pop up ads or some sort mm -hmm. of like you know very in your face marketing. But I think what we're looking at is really more product placement or opportunities yeah. to engage um, in a in a much more virtual reality sort of way, right? Yeah, I think we'll see all of the above. We will see very uh, uncreative experiences. We'll see stickers. We'll see badges. Uh, but then there may be some things that are more subtle, you know, product placement. There may be interesting games. Maybe I'll be able to have my own uh, virtual Taco Bell franchise, right? Like, it, it's, it's very hard to know. When we look back at how Facebook has evolved and the fact that Farmville was such a big deal for such a long time. I mean, Zynga became a company and it created a whole industry. We have no idea what's going to happen, but I'm sure that we will see all of the above. Annoying, horrible marketing and also <laughs> some very interesting creative experiences that will be worthwhile. Okay, you're laughing, Tamson. What do you think I this acquisition <laughs> means for consumers? Well, I mean, the thing with Facebook is that they have been, as much as their revenue depends on marketers, they've been very anti-marketer from the beginning. I mean, ultimately, they've been about people to people connection. And it, it's funny, the we, when, when Facebook changes their algorithm and everybody complains about it and all of that, it's the marketers, it's the marketer halves of our brains that are complaining. And yet the, the experience I've seen over the last three to six months particularly is a movement of my marketer friends for their personal interactions away from Twitter to Facebook. So when something like Oculus comes along, it my thing is my, you know, yes, there's gonna be bad marketing to the point that Esteban put on it, but I'm really curious <laughs> about how Facebook, where they see this fitting into their long-term plan. Because um, you know, we forget that I think when we start to think about it, we're like, well, how is that experience gonna mesh with Facebook? And I I'd be surprised if you see it meshing with Facebook, the actual platform much at all, particularly in the beginning. So um, I've just, mm. you know, marketers do tend to ruin things and, and Facebook has been <laughs> very good about figuring out how to get marketers out of the core social experience um, and yet continue to eke revenue out of them. So um, <laughs> this one's going to be really interesting to watch because it is it is definitely a long-term play because something like, you know, a, a virtual, and we've been trying, marketers have been trying to figure out how to get virtual reality into uh, the marketplace now for a while. Uh, everyone keeps saying it's the next big thing and yet we still haven't really seen it. Um, and I'm just, I, I'm just curious. It's, it's, it's a fascinating question to figure out where are they going with this? Okay. Well, you mentioned Twitter. Twitter had a big redesign. Looks a little bit familiar to another platform. Um, what do you think about the changes that Twitter is making and how that affects marketers? Well, Twitter's definitely, you know, the first thing you look, you'll notice, of course, and everyone has been saying this, is that if you look at the new Twitter, it looks a heck of a lot like the uh, redesign of Facebook. So the new Facebook that everybody's getting. Um, you know, down to the very blocky, very sharp corners, uh, highly visual. 
I think the highly visual piece is the is the thing that marketers need to take away. Um, that they are the focus is very much on how can you engage more parts of people's uh, brains really with the, the message that you're putting out there um, and visual does that so you can have your text message your text-based message and then you figuring out how else can I get someone to pay attention how else can I create some kind of resonance for that message through through a visual use I think Twitter's just figuring out that you know, there's a lot more that they can do as far as getting messages out there uh, if they allow for that greater ability to in interact with and stick messages better in people's brains. Now, what's interesting, of course, is Twitter has always been much more friendly to marketers and it is very much a marketing platform now. So uh, two or three years ago when, when some of the early opinionators on it said, you know what, Facebook, is, I mean, Twitter is turning into a media channel. Uh, I think they were right. And I think what, what you're seeing now is Twitter starting to stretch its wings a little bit and say, you know, we can be much more powerful as a messaging platform if we put more focus on other ways that people process and retain information and messages. We, we talked to Taco Bell and I mentioned, I think they have a, a great approach on Twitter. Who do you see doing a really good job on Twitter? Tamsin? Uh, well, you know, it, I, I'm going to say that I'm not actually the best person to ask about that right now because it's it really has been, um, you know, a, as my own professional focus has moved away from Twitter, uh, and I I would say it's, I just haven't spent as much time there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna punt that one over to Esteban. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's I, I think I mean Tagable is definitely doing a fantastic job, and, and I like to see brands that try to lead. In, in unique and creative ways. I think Taco Bell has taken that approach of being unique, being innovative, uh, being there on Snapchat and, and, and doing something actually worthwhile there. Um, I actually like a lot of the brands that are consistent also. So not just innovation in terms of a product launch, but consistent innovation and optimization of what they're doing and how they're doing it. So brands like like Nike come to mind, um, that they're consistently good. And as we get into periods like the World Cup, um, or, or uh, the Super Bowl or major events, um, they actually enhance the experience of those events with their content and social is not just an afterthought. It, it's actually very integrated and, and consistent and, and valuable and people really like that. Okay, Tamson, when you and I first met, it was around this conversation of paid, owned and earned media. And we've seen that change somewhat over the years. And I know you're really passionate about that specific part of defining um, the relationship that we have with the customer. What is What has changed in that space of paid, owned, and earned media over the last few years? Well, I, I, this is not a new concept, but it's certainly one that we're seeing realized is that they that if those are three interlocking circles, they are now fusing into one. It's very hard to draw sharp lines now, I'd say, between paid, owned, and earned, um, mostly because the formats are, are changing. And you can't get good earned media without supporting it with from paid. It all has to drive to owned. Uh, and and sometimes, in, well, in, often in, increasingly, what looks like earned media is paid media. So I, I think back to what Chris was saying with Taco Bell, the, the success from a marketer standpoint is that you have to think about how th all three of those work together. Um, you know, if, if from a practical standpoint, you're dealing with multiple agencies, then you need to make sure those multiple agencies are talking to each other. But even more importantly, you need to make sure that there is no single campaign or effort that's only moving or only existing within one of those channels. They have to talk to each other. And that's a, that, the, how they talk to each other and how they organically boost each other up is something you need to be planning from the beginning. Esteban, you, um, you were pretty excited about kind of maybe some of the social platforms that are out there and what we're using. What would you recommend that somebody who's trying to manage social media at a small business level use to gauge the relationship with their customer? Um, this is going to sound very cliche, but you, you have to be where your audience is and most likely they are on Facebook or they are on Twitter. It really comes down to the, the your ability to be there 
and to consistently support a channel. I, I see so many, even large brands launching accounts for a conference or launching accounts for a, a sub brand or a sub product or, or, or something that just happened in a temporary manner. And that never works out. You want to have you want to create a place where people can come as a destination and you also want to be able to understand where your audience is so that you can reach them. And and I would say that a lot of the rules that apply to big brands also apply to smaller brands. It's not just about engagement for the sake of engagement. You know, anyone can just get a bunch of memes uh, or meme images and animated GIFs and just post them all over the web and you'll get engagement. But it doesn't mean anything unless you're you're driving towards something. And that's probably the biggest mistakes that small companies do, they either engage just for the heck of engagement or they create an account that they can't support and they can't uh, manage for the long term. So Tamsin, you have been on the agency side um, for a while and you see the evolution of the change in agencies. Are there agency experiences that as a, as a, as a, as a brand that we should look for? I mean, how should we define who's going to help us with our, our strategy moving forward? With all the channels changing all the time, with everything evolving so much, I think it's nearly impossible for marketers internal to an organization to stay on top of the channels. And that's where people are getting themselves in trouble, much, much like Esteban just said. Uh, you start to chase the channels, then you are absolutely dead in the water as far as um, being able to plan effectively for things to actually happen. So when it comes to figuring out where can an agency help you, um, I'm going to argue that most organizations are fairly good at understanding the core of their own brand, the core of what it is that they want to accomplish. And so looking, look for an agency that fills in the gaps that you don't feel you're already strong with. Rather than try to bring it in-house, rather than try to figure it out for yourself, if you can go with an agency, if, if you're not good at figuring out what the channels are, then go with a digital agency that is, that's their job to stay up on top of the channels. If you're not good at figuring out, well, how do I translate this brand message I have into something that makes sense out in the marketplace? Well, then work with an organization that's best at that. Um, and, and, and it's up to the individual marketing departments, really, which works best for you, whether you're the person that's operating as the contractor to all those subcontractors, or whether or not you want to go with an agency that says they can do everything equally well. Uh, my experience is that even for agencies that say they can do everything equally well, they just simply can't. Um, it's lovely to be out of agencies and to be able to say that with freedom. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I really think that's true. I think it's hard to get everything that you want w really well in one place. But the, but the benefit is, is that then you don't have to worry about how those, how those things are all working together. At least ideally, you don't. So Pinterest is going to, is moving into the ad space. I'm a big fan of Pinterest. I'm a little addicted to pinning, uh, but I love it. It's going to change the experience, but I think there's a lot of opportunity here. They're setting that price though a little high. What do you think about Pinterest and their uh, movement towards um, paid advertising? Well, I think, um, it you know, like any of these platforms, they have to figure out how are they going to make more money uh, off of it. Uh, advertising is obviously one of those ways to do it. Uh, I think what you're seeing in, you know, if there's a high price piece of it, what they're basically saying is we put a high premium on our audience and you need to really want to be here in order to do that. And I think that's a good thing for them. Um, of course, marketers are going to complain about that. I mean, marketers are going to say, oh, it's too expensive to be there. But at the same time, that also means that Marketers have to be very, very thoughtful about making sure that the investment that they do make is worthwhile. And uh, so, uh, frankly, I think you know, from from Pinterest's point of view, it makes a lot of sense. We'll you know we'll see whether or not marketers bite, but uh, I like the message it sends about what they're what they're protecting uh, with their with their audience. You know, I, I think when you have a, a free, you know, they're not earning money, they're not making money right now, and that's the direction they have to go. We always seem to, we said this about Facebook, I'm going to leave, I'm not going to use it, but as consumers, we will use it, and I think there's a lot of opportunity here. What do you think, Esteban? Are you a pinner? Uh, oh, I use Pinterest all the time. I like to say that my brain is on Pinterest because it remembers things that I don't, and um, I personally don't use Pinterest to follow anyone around. So brands that are spending money there are probably not going to reach me unless I'm forced to be reached. Um, that being said, I, I think Pinterest is doing a, a good job with it. And they, they're really taking a page from the Tumblr playbook, which is let's do this in a way that 
is carefully done, it feels premium, it's good for the users and it's good for the brands. And Instagram is trying to do the same thing. I think Instagram got a little bit of backlash because it was so uh, obvious and because the audience there is so used to an experience, whereas on Tumblr and Pinterest, it's not as intrusive. I think that's the, the thing that brands have to be very careful of. You don't want to infiltrate social networks. You don't want to be annoying. You want to be relevant. And if you're going to pay to play, which is the only business model, there's really only two business models on social media, right? It's either you pay to play, and that's how Facebook, Twitter, everybody makes money, or the other business model is your WhatsApp and you never charge anything and then you end up at Facebook. So <laughs> it ends up being with the same business model. So brands will have to pay always at some point. And consumers are just gonna have to get used to that. It's always been that way. Facebook's allowed advertising since 2006. I posted ads at universities in 2006. You know, it, it, it's never been um, different, but consumers are, are more and more resistant because they're getting bombarded and, and brands have to be really careful of that. Well, and as marketers, we tend to complain when we get something for free, like we're doing with Pinterest and it's driving traffic, that we actually might have to pay for it. So um, I appreciate both of you joining the show. You know, Esteban, what is something that you're watching right now? What is a digital trend that's important to you? I think the whole privacy, secrecy environment is going to be really interesting. Um, I can't wait for an agency to say that they have a, a whisper strategy or, or, a, or a secret app strategy. Um, I think it, sometimes agencies and, and, and marketers get excited about some of these things that are happening in, in the consumer space. And it will be interesting to see whether that whole trend just fades away in a couple of months or or maybe it will be a big deal. And, and more than uh, beyond the marketing side of it, I, I do think that there is a, a consumer need for privacy that is, um, if not a fundamental right, uh, something that I that that I appreciate, and I think everybody appreciates. So it's something that we should definitely watch and, and see what happens. And Tamson, what are you watching? What's what's something that you're looking for, and you see a lot of opportunity? Well, I, what I think is really interesting is the is the potential around really understanding our customers better. I mean, we're at the point where. Uh, because there's so many players in the market, because social and content marketing has become the absolutely late majority for most marketers, uh, it means that the things that were working when people started and even the best practices right now are not going to continue to work because everybody is doing the same thing. And the only thing is le that's left is having a really clear understanding of who your audience is, what they need and want, and how your particular company delivers exclusively to them on that. Uh, and that means that brands have to get much, much better about understanding their, their audience and their marketplace, not just at the aggregate level of, you know, here's this target demo, but understanding really to the point of uh, how do I market to this particular person um, using that combination of paid, owned, and earned? How do I eventually get them to a point where I have an email address or I have something where I can be interacting with that person one-on-one, -on -one, even now automated, um, in a way that reflects that person's history with the brand, what they what they particularly care about, and and all of that. I think that that intersection of of big data with audience strategy as being the real driver before you ever get to content strategy uh, is something I think that we're going to see being absolutely necessary moving forward. And Tamson, if somebody wants to connect with you or follow you, what's the best way they can do that? Huh, these days, it's I'm, I'm like I said, been pretty quiet on on Twitter, but that's probably the best place. Every now and then, I'll pop in and 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 say something. Uh, otherwise, it's it's paying attention to what we're doing over at Aradium. We're going to be launching a blog there fairly soon, um, and paying attention to what we're doing there. And running, when do you run in the marathon? When is that? Uh, it's two weeks from yesterday. So holy cow! <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. I've been following you and your uh, your progress on that. So it'll be exciting to see that happen. Thanks so much. And Esteban, if somebody wants to connect with you, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, Twitter is definitely the best way to reach me. So at Social Nerdia or Social Nerd IA. Um, Twitter is definitely the best way. I don't email is hard to hard to follow up on. Well, thanks again, both of you for joining us for Marketing Mavericks, and I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank Abs you. Absolutely. So that was Marketing Mavericks, and our first Maverick does uh, Taco Bell. We're really excited to have Chris join us, uh, Tamson and Esteban as well. 
We have more great lineups coming up in the future. Thanks again and um, have a great day.